This is Ram from 1349 and I'm blowing it up on Capital Chaos TV. Hi, this is Todd Owens with Capital Chaos TV and we're here tonight at the DNA Lounge in San Francisco. Honored to have Robin from 1349 with us. How are you doing tonight, Robin? Well, quite good. Thank you, sir. Uh, I guess first off, we'll just talk a little bit about this tour. I think you did, this is the 18th show out of 19 or something like that. So you got one more show to go. So how's the tour been so far? And maybe talk a little about the bands with you guys. Well, the tour's been really good. It's, uh, it's the third tour on, uh, on Massive Cauldron of Chaos. And um, I think that uh, with the whole package of the other bands and everything, this is the, the tour that I, I, that's uh, been most well received as well. Uh, like Tombs and Full of Hell fills out uh, uh, the package and uh, it's uh, interesting um, and it's also a good personal relations in, in the band and not that it, none of that happened on the other tours but it's, you can always feel that there's some tours is always uh, something better going on and then the other was more get a better feeling for it and the crowd seems to be really into it also the really good crowd sold out shows some places and uh, but there's all the shows has been re really well received and uh, a lot of people coming out so since that people are into it too so how much if any input do you have with the uh, into the bands that you get to tour with oh quite a lot actually we um it's always a discussion with the booking agent and management and we go through lists of band and who, who would be possible candidates and who can do it and, and, and so on. So that's important to you then? Yeah, of course, it's, it's more and more important and uh, to, to get a, a good package is kind of the key element of touring and uh, that's what you have, need to nail down in order to, to, to get a tour going and to, to have it selling basically that's the main thing have a good interesting upcoming band and um, bands that have albums out and have a bus you know that's it, that's what it all that's what it's all about and uh winding down this portion of the tour but you, you have future tour pans after this where where else is uh, 1349 going to be well we head to um, australia new zealand next we do, well first we do Blastfest in Norway and then we fly directly to uh, Australia and New Zealand and uh, when we come back uh, the festival season starts in Europe so then we will uh, do uh, some festivals in um, different places in Europe dur during the summer and we'll, uh, we're working on, um, uh, on a European tour but we always do that so that the touring market in Europe is uh, it's, it's really hard. We, we toured so much more in the US, so it's easier to get things set up over here and to find the right package for us in Europe has proven difficult for some, some reason. I don't know why, but it's it's not that we don't want to tour in Europe. It's uh, just have been uh, proving uh, more difficult than uh, touring in the US. Longer drives in the US, right? Between shows? Yeah, it's longer drives, obviously, but... Uh, you covered quite a bit on this. I think you started out in Miami and Northeast and then all the way across the West, uh, all the way out to California. So, And you were in San Diego yesterday. Yeah. And you come back to San Francisco and then you back to L.A. tomorrow. So that's kind of crazy traveling. Uh, crossing the grapevine twice. Yeah, and that's, that, uh, No, it, it's, we started on the East Coast, as you said, and those drives were pretty pretty decent. But when we, st when we started crossing over from Russia to going to Chicago and then... Uh, Heading from Kansas City to uh, to Denver and, and out, so it's it's been a long stretch. But I mean, that's that's what touring is about. So you can't complain about the drives. It's just like we have to nail down the logistics with uh, with the people driving and uh, if they're up for it. I always like for when we uh, the show in Russia that were, were put on uh, later than the others. To kind of fill out, uh, I don't like um, days off on tour because I like to when the first over here we need want to play every night. So then uh, when that show was added, uh, and we had to run that through with the uh, people driving. Is it is it doable? Do you want to do it because of the winter and everything? And we barely dodged that huge fucking storm that's on the other. Other side now, so uh, we got lucky. Uh, we could have been stuck out there, you know. It's like 
it's always a risk about touring in the winter, but exciting times. Um, just wanted to go back briefly. I guess it's been about 16 months since the last album, uh, Massive Cauldron of Chaos, is out. So maybe just some quick thoughts on the album 16 months later, and obviously been touring a lot for it. Um, I think it's great, great production on the album and uh, very thrashy. I like it a lot. So uh, any thoughts on the album? Yeah, Master Cauldron of Chaos is, uh, as you say, have a more trashy vibe to it in general. It's also, uh, we were aiming for um, uh, to capture more of the, the live uh, sound feeling uh, into the album as well. So we brought uh, Jared Pritchard, who is our uh, front of house engineer. He's also an outstanding studio uh, engineer and uh, also mastering engineer. So we brought him in. He's from the US, I guess? Yeah. He lives in Florida, he's a Virginia guy, but uh, we brought him in, flew him to Norway and uh, brought him into the, the studio that we use and we used for the last uh, five albums. And he, uh, he kind of got the best out of us basically. He, he knows how we function and what we do live and to kind of uh, capture the energy and the best out of us, he, kn he knows and also he's been touring with us for many years so he kind of knows it yeah yeah so it's it was a in many ways to, to record i i always been uh, sitting through the whole re recording process and mixing process and being in the studio all the time but this time around when bringing him in uh, he was there all the time and uh, i i could relax much more and i felt that this album was the the one that came together uh, the easiest basically I remember er earlier albums when uh, like the whole mixing process and it's been uh, a hell getting kind of all the frequencies lined out and getting the uh, getting the songs together but it's also when you s when you sit in the middle of it it's hard to s take a step back you know and, and to see that but to have a guy that's already there and he, 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 yeah you trust him everything's in his mind it's nailed down and we talk about it a lot in forehand and everybody's agreed to where which direction we're going and uh, he has an air for uh, for music in, in general that um, makes it really easy to work with him he, he understands exactly uh, what to do and how you want it to sound so uh, it was uh, very easy actually to do that and uh, I um, I would say that we would definitely work with him again in the future. Very happy still all this time later. Um, wanted to ask about the band and a lot of bands today in metal and stuff like that, a lot of lineup changes and stuff like that, and you guys have been pretty constant. Um, I guess you lost a founding member back maybe 10 years ago or whatever, but even since then you've just kind of kept that core four going. So what's your secret to keep the band together all that time and good group of guys? Well, it's not so much the band is. Uh, I think the secret lies in that the band is founded upon uh, different perspectives than a lot of other bands. Uh, normally, bands is founded by friends that come together and they want to play music and uh, and have fun. I founded 1349 because I disliked the direction that Norwegian black metal took in the later half of the 90s. And I wanted to wanted it to take a step away from all the symphonic, uh, pompous uh, sounding. So I uh, I just took matter into my own hand, and I was so fortunate to find people around me that that share that same thought and interest and wanted to to be a part of it. And that's the reason for 1349. And we we still think that we are on a mission to maintain, develop and take care of the heritage that Norwegian black metal is and mean to us. And I think that's probably a reason why we were why we're still doing it and why we still have a core like we do, you know. I'm glad you guys are doing it, keeping keeping that flame alive. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, I want to go back early on maybe to you when you were young and in your formative years, maybe a few bands that really influenced you the most or inspired you I guess well it's quite a few band that has inspired me but, but the general aspect for me has always been when it comes to 
the music that inspires me is to to find music that has uh, a, a darkness to it that 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 has always been like a, a hook for me to um, I feel that the artist performing it has a darkness in his soul basically which is being performed throughout the musical uh, through his music and um, this the genre of the music doesn't matter that much to me it's it's the it's the feeling that, that's always been important even since I when I first started listening to music it was like I was always captured by the groove and the feeling in the in like old uh, like 70s music uh, I listen I remember listening to uh, Deep Purple and Jimi Hendrix you know and it was yeah, yeah and, the, and the feeling and the performance and you listen to like live material and um, how, how much it switched out and they did like jam sessions and and recorded like live in La Chan, for instance, when I heard that, and it's like, wow, how how different every version was, you know, and that they played with their soul, and uh, when you add the darkness to that, on top of it, that's that's when I really find it fascinating, and that's uh, that's music that I like to listen to. But when it comes to metal and um, something obviously happened to me when I when I caught uh, Slayer for the first time. But when it comes to black metal, it was an instant hit, uh, and I knew that this was the genre I had uh, had been uh, envisioned and had ideas for in my mind as well. Was there a particular Norwegian band? Or? Yeah, it was Burson. Yeah. I heard Burson for the first time, and that was my way into black metal. It's like, what's this band? It's Burson, All right? What kind of what? What's 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 the name of this music? You know, it's black metal. Okay, that's the reference point I have. So that's kind of my beacon. Norwegian black metal. It's Burson, and that feeling that that music gave me. That's my reference point for, for naming all other types of music. If if the, the if the music gives me that feeling, it's black metal to me. And doesn't matter if people say that they play black metal. If you don't, if that feeling doesn't get evoked in me, then I well, you can label your music black metal. It doesn't give me the feeling of black metal. So that. It's a bit personal, and but black metal is personal and it's supposed to be that, and um, that's what also what separates it from uh, from other genres, I think. All right, I think just uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you about is beer. I think you're a, a big beer fan, or you in particular, or some members of the band. We're all uh, we're all very fond of beers, yeah, and uh, among other things. <laughs> Um, and I know at one point you had a, your own beer out, right? I don't know if that's still in production or if that was just a limited run of 1349 beer. We do have we have two beers out actually. We um, we met a, a brewer. Uh, we were out touring with Tripticon uh, in 2010. We met a brewer named Todd Haug up in Minneapolis, and um, he works for a brewery called Surly. And he came out to the show and he saw that. Um, they were picky about the beer that uh, we drank at the bar, so he he came over and uh, introduced himself and he said that yeah, if you want to make a beer sometime, we should do that. And then uh, Frost, our uh, drummer, he said that no, oh, we should make two beers. We should make a black ale and a pale ale, and that's where it all started. And then we started emailing and talking back and forth, and we got a Norwegian brewery uh, into this and. Um, so we made one batch in Europe with uh, first a black ale, which is uh, holds 13.49 percent, and uh, then we made a pale ale, which holds 6.66 percent. And those are the two uh, beers that we have: um, Lervik made them in Norway, and then Surly brewed them in the U.S. Just four, four, four beers, but it's the same recipe. You know, do you, uh, is that one thing traveling across the U.S., do you sometimes 
miss beer from back home or you find you can usually find some good beer here. no it's uh, you always find new beer and uh, that's kind of the, some of the quests that we do that we we uh, we hit up breweries and uh, we always go out tasting new types of beer and you're not stuck drinking PBR no I don't drink PBR <laughs> no Pabst no Blue Ribbon for me is yes. uh, Anything else you wanted to add, Capital Chaos TV people out there? I just want to say thank you for uh, taking some time to be with us, So, uh, Robin. Well, thank you for watching, and uh, thank you for all the support 1349 has gotten uh, over the years. And uh, as long as we have our fans, we will continue. So.